Welcome to this session of LitFestX. Uh, we have with us Dr. Daniel Goldman. Sorry, he doesn't like to be called doctor, but he is a psychologist and a you know, best-selling author. Um, Dan, very, very welcome to uh, LitFestX and great to have you with us. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Today we are gonna be discussing uh, Daniel's latest book, which in the US is called Altered Traits and in India and other parts of the world is called The Science and Art of Meditation. Uh, Dan, you've done several, several years of research as a practitioner and as a researcher on meditation, and you've come up with some amazing insights on what works, what doesn't work, and what are some of the sort of standard myths about meditation and what it can do for the human brain. You know, run us through how your journey started with meditation. Sure. Well, my journey actually started in India. I lived in India for two years when I was a graduate student and postdoc. Um, I got a Harvard traveling fellowship to uh, go to India. And my interest was in uh, meditation, which at that time was a very exotic idea. No one in psychology had paid much attention to it. But um, I was very interested in meditation as a way to develop human qualities that ordinarily are underdeveloped, things like equanimity, uh, compassion, ongoing presence, attentiveness. And I saw it as representing the upside of human potential. Uh, my studies have been in clinical psychology, which is really about pathology, about what goes wrong with the mind, not what could go right. So I came to India and I was interested in meeting with people who had done years and years of meditation. Uh, and I, I did uh, manage to meet some yogis and some lamas who had done uh, really a lifetime of work. And they were stunningly different from other people I had met in that they were totally present, that they, you felt an unconditional love that, um, you know, it's what in India is called darshan. You really felt something from them. And I went back to Harvard and told my professors there about this, and they thought it was the silliest idea they ever heard. weren't at all interested, but I still did go ahead and do my dissertation on meditation as a way to lower reactivity to stress. And uh, another graduate student, Richard Davidson, was very interested. He did his dissertation on meditation and attention, developing attention. At the time we did it, there were just three published articles in the peer review literature that we could cite. Uh, Richie, as we call him, is now one of my oldest and closest friends. We looked at the literature these days, and now there are more than 6,000 um, scientific articles on meditation. We use very rigorous uh, methodological criteria to winnow them down to about 60 that are very strong. And on the basis of that, I can say with confidence, meditation works. It starts right from the beginning. It, it helps attention improve, helps people recover from stress more quickly, be less stressed. No question about it. The, the data shows that. And also, the longer you do it, or more years you do it, even if you do you know, a little bit at home every day, it adds up. There's what we call a, a dose-response relationship. So the more advanced meditators show many more benefits from it. The most advanced meditators, and these were yogis that we, uh, Davidson flew over from India and Nepal to his lab, uh, have a brain function that's never been seen before. It's so radically different. This is why we call the book in the States Altered Traits, because we felt that even though the temporary changes that show up right at the beginning are good, uh, the most impressive changes are at the upper end of that spectrum uh, with the yogis and there there are really lasting changes in the brain in biology and in mental function uh, that you just don't see in ordinary people so you said something very important uh, uh, dan in your book where you mentioned that it's it's not just the number of hours of practice but you need smart practice. So, you know, yeah. tell us in terms of data science, how, how is the smart practice different from just the quantum? This comes from literature on expertise in any domain. I mean, it applies to golf, it applies to chess, uh, and, uh, or, or, or to cricket for that matter. Uh, it has to do with 
not just learning the basic steps. This is what most amateurs do. For example, uh, I'm going to meditate with my mantra. I sit down and my mind wanders and I bring it back sometimes, sometimes I don't. Uh, you know, people who start out in golf or in chess, or whatever, plateau generally at the level of amateurs. The professionals, however, do smart practice. In smart practice, you have a coach who is very skilled, who observes how you're doing very carefully and suggests to you what to practice next in order to have a continuous curve of improvement. And that's what you see in world-class athletes or world-class performers, uh, musicians or singers or athletes all have coaches over the course of their entire career. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, the hours of practice and the duration it would take to achieve the level of brain function that you have researched in some of the lamas and the yogis, um, yeah. what is the kind of, um, you know, data pointing to in terms of duration, you know, how many years or how many thousand hours would it typically yeah. take before somebody attains that level of brain function? Well, uh, we, we uh, use the the metric of the total lifetime hours. The reason is you could meditate every day for 10 minutes or for an hour, but over 10 years, that's gonna make a huge difference in the total time you put in. So uh, the beginners we looked at are generally from zero to 100 hours and benefits show up even after seven or eight hours, particularly interestingly for compassion meditation, uh, meditating on uh, wishing other people well, that they not have suffering, that they be happy, and so on. See, the brain seems to be very ready, in fact, primed to learn to love better, which is kind of encouraging. Uh, we also see very early results for uh, strengthening attention, better concentration, better learning, in fact, better exam scores. Uh, it is very <laughs> inspiring if you're a student. Turns out it pays off to do a, a meditation daily. Uh, and then the next segment is from uh, we, about a thousand to ten thousand lifetime hours. And these are people who have generally been meditators for decades, uh, and there, as I said, the the benefits get stronger. The yogis had from twelve thousand to sixty-two thousand lifetime hours. That's an enormous wow. amount wow. of time spent on retreat. Uh, if you do a classic, for example, a, a Tibetan three-year retreat, you get a total of about 10,000 hours. So imagine 62,000. That's, that's a lot of time spent focus, you know, working with your mind. And there, uh, the benefits were pretty amazing. They'd never been seen by neuroscience before. One that I found particularly impressive has to do with what's called the gamma EEG. Ordinarily, if you have a creative insight, a great idea, or you've had a writer's block and now you see your way around it, whatever it may be, uh, the brain at that moment will show what's called the gamma wave. It's the most intense high energy wave, high amplitude. Uh, it lasts for about a quarter to a half second, um, but it's rarely seen otherwise. But the yogis have gamma in their brain wave all the time. Science has never found that before. And it suggests a very different way of experiencing the world. You know, Dan, when you talk about the EEG brainwave patterns, you know, high frequency, so whether it's high beta or, you know, gamma, um, do you think it's possible then for people in day-to-day -day lives who are, let's say, suffering from mental health disorders, you know, maybe depression or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Uh, have you seen instances where uh, they've been able to be cured just by meditation? Well, you know, we don't uh, put much stock in anecdotal evidence. You know, that uh, you hear stories, this person, that person tried this or that. Exactly. And we look at large data sets and hear... Uh, it's encouraging, actually, the, the, uh, what's called the meta-analysis, which is an aggregate of many different separate studies, sure. shows that uh, mindfulness-based therapies and meditation itself can help with um, ordinary anxiety and depression. What I mean by that is not bipolar. Bipolar is purely biological. Uh, but 
garden variety depression, which is not oh. based on an imbalance in, in uh, brain chemical that's genetic, uh, is helped very much. And I think that's very encouraging because anxiety problems and depression, mild depression, are epidemic in modern life. And it suggests that meditation can help. It's too early to say what the data will show about other disorders. Right. Have, have you also then been tracking uh, EEG brain data for people who are doing meditation in day-to-day -day life as well? Uh, there's not much work going on in that area yet. I think it's a very interesting project, but it implies something that I would like to see that has not happened. When you say, uh, have you done that kind of thing? You're talking about a long-term longitudinal study. Sure. People are measured uh, over a long period, like months, years even. Sure. It needs to happen. The data points we have, the longest that um, people were measured while meditating is about three months so far. I'd love to see the study that you suggest done. Uh, it would be very expensive. That's one reason it hasn't been done. Sure. Yeah. You know, uh, let's talk uh, about some of the, uh, you know, common and I would say modern myths about meditation. You know, I think meditation went through this phase of being promoted as the new hip thing, uh, you know, for people to do. You know, uh, you go to the gym, you run, you play golf, and now you're supposed to meditate. And it was being uh, sort of tom tommed as uh, one cure for many ailments. Uh, um, so tell us some, uh, something about those myths and what were your discoveries? Yes, I think there's some kernel of truth, but not as much as uh, people are promoting meditation, particularly who are getting people to pay for it, uh, might want you to believe. There's a lot of interest, for example, in the business sector in, uh, today in meditation. And I think some of the people that are bringing, you know, mindfulness or whatever to the business sector um, maybe are over promoting it. Uh, I, it is true that meditation is the equivalent of a mental fitness workout. We usually don't discipline our mind in terms of training attention and noticing when the mind has wandered and bringing it back. We more usually are just swept away by our thoughts. Uh, and meditation put, helps you put a stake in the ground, uh, at least the mental landscape, and say, okay, I'm going to stick with this. And that strengthens the neural circuitry. On the other hand, I, I think meditation is oversold in many ways uh, because people will take uh, a study that's not so good and say, well, a scientific study showed this or that. And that's why we were very careful to use the most rigorous studies uh, in, in our work. And Dan, you mentioned something about how meditation, like you said, can help with the garden variety, so to say, of uh, depression or anxiety. Um, what has been your experience with some of the biological issues going on with the brain and with the mind? And uh, for example, let's say ADHD or ADD. Sure. I think it's a very promising uh, area because uh, attention deficit disorder which is now treated by medication in children uh, is rampant. It may be a side effect of modern life. We don't know why it's happening. It may be overdiagnosed. We don't know. Uh, billions of dollars are being made by pharmaceutical companies selling medications that work well in the first year, so-so the second, and not very well after the third year, according to very rigorous tests. What has been tried, oddly enough, is simply help kids train attention. Think about it, attention deficit disorder. Why not give it a try? Well, one reason is it's very inexpensive. Drug companies won't pay for those studies. But on the other hand, it's very promising and it's starting to happen. And the first findings are, are quite hopeful. So we'll wait and see. Great. Um, I will bring this session to an end now, Dan. Uh, thank you so much for... Uh, you know, talking to us about the exciting work you've done for the book. And certainly uh, you are uh, on your path to getting the darshan like the several yogis and lamas uh, you have tracked over the years. Well, I've got um, a lot of tens of thousands of hours to go. But thank you. It's been a pleasure, Kumar. <laughs>